Uh, today's sermon title is called End Time 3, Can You Endure? Um, so it's like we're going through an end time series, and uh, it's the third one. And the title is called Can You Endure? Um, so, Jesus gives us like this whole scenario of the end time. Uh, does anybody know why he might be giving us the whole scenario? It's kind of, remember I told you last time I used to play Zelda and then uh, I had, you know, whenever I get stuck, I go online and Google walkthrough and then I'll be able to come, come past it. Um, so why would give us, give you guys cheat sheet towards the end time? When Jesus is coming back, he gives us a cheat sheet so that we could navigate through. Does anybody know why he might? Is everyone um, shy? So we can win? So you can win, yes. Uh, yes, so you can win, but because it is that important, that hard, it is important, but it's like that hard. Um, I think so, today I think you're gonna be learning, like as you see, um, how just hard it is just to survive the end time. And then the reason is it is to win is to, like I said last week, is so that you and I will come out victoriously, you and I will come out winning, you and I will come out basically saved and not fallen away. And that's the whole purpose of um, Jesus teaching us the end time. He's giving you a cheat sheet and he's going, follow this cheat sheet and you win. But the, one of the main reasons I'm giving you the cheat sheet is because it's that hard. It is that hard. And in the end time, there will be many, many people falling away. That's what Jesus says and that's what Paul says. He says, this is how you know the end is coming when people fall away from God. Like, it literally means, yeah, they say like there's like two billion Christians in the world. Totally don't buy that at all. Uh, but it's like literally like church is going to shrink a lot and church is going to like, it, it seems like it's showing two pictures. Church shrinking a lot, but church also evangelizing and people coming to the Lord a lot. So it's like two pictures are happening. Um, so that's one of the things that's going to happen. And here he's teaching us, he's teaching so that no one will fall away. He's desiring that every single one that he has called, that no one will fall away, that everyone would uh, be faithful in Jesus, uh, that everyone will be saved. Alright, so let's get verse 9. And it says this, And they will be delivering you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you will be hated for my, for my name by all, hated by all nations for my name's sake. Here what Jesus says is this, People will hate you. Are you a follower of Jesus? I hate you. Uh, and he just says, For my name's sake. And you know, here I want to say, this is a promise of Jesus. And I also want to say this, If you're not hated by people around you, my question is, are you truly following Jesus? Because whether you live in America or a third world country where Christians are being persecuted, I believe if you follow Jesus correctly and faithfully, and if you express your faith, there is a part of it that you should be kind of like people don't like you because of Jesus. At the same time, I'm going to give a disclaimer that some Christians are persecuted not for their faith in Jesus, but for their stupidity as well. Uh, you should not be going around with the picketed fence and... Uh, yell at people that they're going to hell. Uh, those are not, you're not being persecuted for Jesus, you're being persecuted for your stupidity. Um, so I'm not talking about that. But I believe if you are following Jesus, what? You should be persecuted in some sense. And you even see that in America where, uh, I, well, let's talk about the third world country or outside of America first. In ISIS, uh, in the Middle East, uh, there's a extreme Islamic terrorist group that kills Christians and their whole goal is to uh, change a whole nation to become an Islamic state. There is no freedom of religion according to their religion. And it's just, you have to be Muslim or we will kill you. And if you remember, one of the horrendous things happened was like, there was like 10 or 20 Christian men. Uh, they would not give up their faith even to a point of death. And they were beheaded uh, by ISIS people. Even in India, uh, there's a Christian town that's been burned. Uh, there's people killed and beaten for their faith. This is something that's very normal. According to um, one of the statistics by Pew Research, uh, they say that there's, there's more people who die for their faith in past 100 years than 1900 years combined. That's how much people are being persecuted. We just don't realize it because we live in America. Um, it's a promise of God that you are supposed to be persecuted. And here I'm gonna talk a little bit of a, a hot topic for America. Um, I believe uh, in America there is a slight subtle persecution that's happening, uh, and there's two areas that's happening. One is, um, uh, the word is tolerance, 
you know, people are like, let's be tolerant. Uh, we should have tolerance for everyone. But then the thing is, I'll be tolerant towards you until you don't have my belief. We'll be tolerant towards you, but if you don't have the same belief that I do, you're, it's like you're totally going against your own definition. Tolerance is to be, be tolerant towards other people. But then if I have a different view from you, you're not going to be tolerant. And it's like this, America has like this thing where, um, you know, back in the days, I don't know if you guys remember, maybe some of you guys are young, but about like 80s and 90s, um, being Democrat was considered, I'm not here to talk about Democrat or Republican, I'm just giving you an example. Being a Democrat was considered kind of like the, oh, you're the sinner kind of people, and being Republican was considered like the righteous people. These days, it kind of flip-flopped, and being a Democrat means you care about the people, being Republican means you're very oppressive and you're mean. And it changed, you know, like Republican, Democrat, their stance even changed too. You think that Democrat was liberal now and Republicans are conservative. Back in like 50, 60 years ago, it was actually the other way. Republicans were liberal and Democrat was conservative. So, you know, it's just, it seems like, but then today's stage, um, there, something that you do realize is that uh, when you're not, for some of the Democratic Party's ideas, you do get persecuted in the media or Facebook or whatever, and you could actually lose your job and stuff. And I'm not here to promote either uh, politic anymore or anything, but I'm just giving you an example. But in the same light of that, I was talking to my wife, and one of the things is uh, concerning homosexuals. Uh, there is a, I was talking to her and, and we're like, you know, what should be our response towards homosexual, right? And my, I was like, you know, I think homosexuals, if they're in the church, we should love them, we should, pray for them, and we should talk to them, we should invite them, we should accept them. At the same time, uh, we don't want to, uh, like, forsake God's truth where, you know, um, it is a sin. Uh, and the Bible says we have love the sinner, but not the sin. Uh, and the other thing is, when it comes to that, what was it? Uh, you know, they always ask this question to Christians, don't they? Do homosexuals go to hell? And, you know, my answer is that, no, they don't. Sinners go to hell. Um, sinner, uh, sin does not discriminate between homosexual or heterosexual. Uh, you sin, you're a sinner, and sinners who are not willing to be forgiven by Jesus will go to hell because they have to pay for their own sin unless you allow Jesus to pay for your sin. Um, so it's not that homosexual goes to hell or heterosexual goes to hell, they all could go to hell if they're not in receiving, in a in posture of receiving forgiveness from Jesus. And in light of what I just said, um, what's interesting is, she, you know, and I were talking, and, and she realized one of the things that's happening in America is that Christians are kind of being persecuted and hated because of homosexual debate. Back in the days, if someone wants to say, you know, like we're, when they were thinking about Christianity, back in the days they were thinking about, oh yeah, it's a place I want to kind of raise my kid in. You know, I think they're going to learn good values and stuff like that. And these days, it's not like that anymore. If they think about Christian, they think about those picketing people who are like, you're going to hell, you know, not even just for homosexuals or whatever. I go to Times Square and there's like all these people who are like, you're going to help people. And I'm like, you know, not that what you're saying is wrong, but can you like talk to people about what it is? You know, like you can't just say the end without explaining things and can you do it in love and can you talk about it? Can you come after talking about it for like, you know, 10, 30 minutes, maybe come to an end that all men deserve hell, but yet Jesus loved them? Like, can you do it in that way? But, you know, it's like, there's so many people who are doing that and it's just like, we don't look good. Um, and to a point where, you know, uh, it seems like for Christians, it seems like we're targeted for things that no other religion tolerates. Uh, what I mean is, uh, there are there has been CEOs and leaders who got fired for their belief and belief they weren't hating on anyone they just believe that it's a part of a sin and people got fired uh, there's uh, Chick-fil-A was supporting a uh, counseling center that helps people men and women that actually comes free from homosexuality and then the you know some of the LGBT community were like we are gonna boycott um who was, uh wait not homosexual. We're gonna boycott Chick Fil A and stuff. And then there's like other other LGBT like my grandma don't approve of my lifestyle, but I'm gonna eat Chick Fil A. It's so good. It was like so funny. I was like, like you know whatever. Uh, and then you know people just there is this there is a uh, because of that I think my wife is right in the sense there is some of, of a subtle um, persecution that's on the church. And I think it's only a start. 
And I think it's going to happen more and more where, um, you know, Bible actually says in 1 Timothy that uh, marriage will be outlawed. And I think, you know, this whole marriage argument, you know, like even today, you think, you know, some of you guys think homosexuality is okay, some of you guys think homosexuality is wrong. You know, uh, I think we're past that now. I think the next debate is incest. There's literally news articles, people who are trying to appeal to your emotion and say incest is okay. In Jersey, incest is already legal. Um, if you were to marry someone, like if you were to marry your son or daughter who is above like 18 or something like that in Jersey, it's legal. And there are articles written today that are kind of appealing to your heart and going and your emotion and going, hey, as long as they're loving each other and not hurting anyone, it's okay, right? Thumbs up. They're not hurting anyone. And there's this, uh, there's this wrong idea that as long as you're not hurting anyone, everything's okay. As long as they're consenting age, everything's okay. That's really where we're going. Go to Japan, you know what's going on? They're past incest stuff. You know where they're at? They're, they're at inanimate object marriage. I'm gonna marry this anime character. I'm gonna marry this, one of the articles I saw was, I'm gonna marry this sex doll. And you know what he said? Sex doll never rejects me. And I'm like, oh my gosh. It's like, we're just going crazy. And you know what? If you believe, if you hold on to the truth of what the Bible says that marriage is between man and woman, you will be persecuted and that's only the start. And for me, I don't hold that standard towards non-Christian. If you're not Christian, if they want to get married, I'm like, hey, go get married. You're not living under God's law. Um, and that's fine with me. But it's just, it's, I, I really see it and it's going to come more. So this is what Jesus says as, as he's going through it. He's like, many, uh, then, they will, then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death and you're going to die. And hated by all for my name's sake. When you truly believe in Jesus, I believe people are supposed to hate you. The reason some of you guys don't feel an ounce of like uh, turmoil in your heart concerning the, what the world says and what God says, it might be because you're not really following Christ. That if Christ was real in your heart, and if you hold on to the, the beliefs that what Christ has said is true, then you would have a this turmoil and you will try to reconcile what does it mean to love people and really believe that everyone is a sinner and that Jesus cares for everyone and that should be a wrestle in our hearts all the days uh, when we live until Jesus comes back. And then not only that, he also says this, he says many will betray one another in verse 10 and then many will fall away because of all these persecution your life is getting killed and whatnot. Many will fall away and they will betray one another and hate one another. It's like you guys are in church, and the people next to you that you love, you consider brother and sister. There will come a time when persecution is so hard, some of us might fall away. Remember I said that? Might fall away, and not only do we fall away, they're going to actually hate each other. You're going to hate them, and they're going to hate you for what you believe. And as people love the world more than Jesus, many will fall away from Jesus. They will choose the culture over what Jesus says. Many will fall away because they love money, not Jesus. Um, not only that, uh, you know, in Revelation it talks about 666, it says, unless you're the mark of the beast, you can't buy anything. You want to go to a grocery mark and buy some food, you better have this mark that says, um, you belong to Antichrist. And unless you have that mark, you can't buy anything. You will go hungry. You can't get a job. And then many of us, for the love of money and love of comfort, will deny Jesus. And many will fall because they're deceived by the world, and after being falling away, they will betray one another. It's just like Judas, who's been with Jesus for three and a half years, and then at the end of Jesus' ministry, he betrays Jesus for only 30 pieces of silver, and he just, you know, um, <coughs> sends him to get crucified. In China, there is a book called uh, The Heavenly Man. He talks, about a, he talks about a story where there are literal non-Christians trying to find out where the uh, underground churches are, and they try to get your names and where you live and everything. They get a list and then they give it to the government so that the people in the church will get uh, sent to jail and so that they could get promoted. And like, there's stuff that are happening and it's like people betraying one another. Even in Korea, there's literally people who are infiltrating churches, like regular mega churches. And you know what their goal is? To cause division and break the church. This is crazy in Korea. There's just like their whole goal, some of the people, there's literally a religious 
uh, cultish sect, their whole goal is to go infiltrate the church, act and sound like the church, uh, act like the church and sound like the church, and your whole job is to go and cause division and make sure church fall apart. This is literally their goal. Bible says that there will be many great falling away before the end time, and many will fall away for different reason, and there will be, and many will betray one another. And this is something that's going to be normal, I believe, even in America. Um, and one of the things that it says in this Bible verse is this: that many will fall away because they love to sin. Many will fall away because they love to sin. This is from verse twelve, which is the next slide, and it says this: and because lawlessness, lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. The lawlessness here is talking about um, not obeying law. They want the law to be disappeared. They want to break law as long as they can sin. We're becoming a society of somewhat of a lawlessness. You know what's, you know what's interesting? Um, do you know what you call a black man who wants to sell weed on the street? Drug dealer. Drug dealer. Do you know what to call a white man in Colorado who wants to sell weed in a store? Businessman. Businessman. Isn't that interesting? One guy wants to make money selling weed, another guy wants to, you know, sell weed too and make money. In one state is, you know, if you own a store, um, you're a business owner, and in another state, you're a drug, drug dealer. Um, like, it was just funny, because like, uh, you know, they sent so many people to jail for drug dealing weed and stuff like that, but yet, now they legalize weed, and then they like, you know, they want to capitalize on weed and stuff. Uh, there's like a lot of money to be made. And they, you know, capitalize and they become businessmen selling weed. Um, I don't know if some of you guys know, uh, back in the, I think, 90s or, or something, uh, there was actually CIA, they were working with the drug lords, and CIA, like, people were making millions off on, like, drug dealings and stuff like that. People are corrupted. <laughs> and, you know, they're just, it's just, yeah, it's just funny. You know, in Korea, uh, cheating on your wife is no longer considered illegal anymore. You know why that changed? They're like, I like cheating on my wife. I like cheating on my husband. Can we please change the law that says cheating is illegal? And 2004 or early 2015, they changed the law. Um, cheating is no longer a legal thing. Cheating is no longer something that you could use as an excuse for divorce in court anymore. Cheating is something that's acceptable now. They don't want the law. Do you know that in Korea, you know how they have a flash cam uh, when you pass the red light, you get a picture taken? Uh, in Korea, uh, they get a picture taken and they get sent to their home. You know, like a lot of people got caught cheating by those camera pictures. So they were like, can you please mosaic our faces? <laughs> like, this is what was happening in Korea. It's crazy. Um, you know, uh, it, it's like cheating on your wife is no longer, it's like we desire to sin. And we don't want, we change the law because we become lawless more and more. We're like, I don't like the law because it doesn't suit my desire for evil intention. So let's delete that law. Let's change that law. It says men will become lawlessness and then their love will grow cold because of it. They will no longer uh, be loving towards people. Uh, do you remember when... Uh, What's interesting about this whole argument in, the, in, in our current generation is that, remember I said in the uh, first point that uh, people say stuff like this, as long as you're not hurting anyone, it's okay. Do whatever you want. Well, you know, I kind of want to challenge that uh, cultural mindset a little bit. Um, what's interesting is I think uh, today our emotional pain is as valid as your physical pain. If you're emotionally hurt, it's as bad as like you being physically beat to the pulp or something. Uh, I read an article and it says something like this. The title says, I'm a liberal professor who serves in a college and I'm scared of my liberal students. And he's not really talking about the liberal conservative thing. He's just talking about just the culture today. And what he was talking about was this. He would teach the class about different things and about 10 years ago, he was teaching a class about like racial disparity and uh, racism and in economics and stuff like that. And then his students were like, you know, the problem with America is this, is that we take the money from the white and give it to the black so that they can afford a house. And when the white person can't afford the house anymore, it's like, we're doomed. And then the professor wisely said, well, your view is very simplistic way of looking at economic. And many economic profes uh, professors and profes professionals would kind of 
think that you're, you have a very simplistic way of looking at it. The student that really pissed off wrote a letter, this is like about 10 years ago, he said, wrote a letter to the school, and then the school had to address it with the, with the professor, but then they deemed it as, after they heard both sides, they deemed it as, as a valid way of teaching. What he did wasn't wrong, and he was able to keep his job. In the modern day today, however, he said this, if you bring up like classical stuff, like you know, Pride and Prejudice and Mark Twain's and all these classical writing that kind of could be hurting, you know, like kind of like rub people the wrong way, he said, and when students get rubbed the wrong way and they complain about it, professors can actually lose a job now. There is no such thing as job security for the professors. If the students don't like you, you're not a good professor and you can actually lose a job for doing those things. So now professors have to actually tailor it because they don't want to hurt emotions of the students anymore. Even today, um, this, oh man, we're just raising such free sauce when I think about it, um, our generation, sorry. Even on the news recently, I saw recent, uh, a month ago, um, this college professor who was a uh, athlete, no he wasn't a professor, he was an athlete coach for like one of the sports, like basketball or something, for men's team. The students um, complained to the school that they're, he's working them way too hard. They're like the last of their district, whatever, uh, what is it? Like, not district, uh, the, the, division. Huh? Oh, division, division, yeah. They're in like, the, they're like the last place in their division. Their coach is like pushing them hard, yo, we gotta work on this and whatnot. And then the students are like, oh, they're working us too hard, and then they complain, and then the coach can't do that anymore. And I'm like, dude, you're a college athlete. You're supposed to train hard, and you're supposed to be someone that, like, I'm hoping one day you guys could become, like, this professional NBA player or a professional, you know, uh, Olympic player or whatever. You cannot be saying this is too hard and whatnot. And it's like whatever the student wants, whatever the emotional pain is of the students, is it trumps everything. Truth does not matter anymore. In the same way, do you guys remember um, the, the Sandy Hook Elementary uh, shootings? Do you know what Obama did right after? And this is, I'm gonna talk about gun control, but I'm not really taking a stance on anything, but I'm just, I just wanna talk about how we argue about gun control stuff. You know what Obama did? He brings a bunch of Sandy Hook little kids, elementary kid, and you know what his statement was? If you are against gun control, you do not love these kids, because gun, without having gun control, we killed all these kids that, and whatnot. And I'm like, wow, that's not even a logical argument. It's just, you're appealing to people's emotion and you think you're gonna win them. And this is actually how it's taught in lawyer school. If you don't care about the truth, you have to win, no matter what. And how are you gonna win? Touch on the jury's heart. Touch on their emotion. And it doesn't matter if it's the truth or not. And a lot of the president and a lot of the uh, politicians are, you know, they're law studies, right? They're, they're law students. So what do they do? Win at no matter what cost. Who cares about what's right or wrong? Let's just touch people's heart and, you know, but everyone has a cause. No matter what, what side it is, everyone has a cause. What if someone had a story where, they, oh, wait, okay, here's a true story. Lady, a man came in to the lady's house trying to rob the place. She had a handgun and she shot the guy like six, seven times. He still gets up and he's still trying to beat her up and then eventually he ran away. That's a true story. She couldn't protect herself through guns. Oh, emotionally, hey, let's look at this. She must have been devastating. You could go either way with emotion. Everyone has a story. Emotions are not what should be driving our nation concerning thinking what's right or wrong. You see, we're going into an era where truth is very relevant. It's all about your truth is your truth, my truth is my truth. As long as my truth doesn't hurt anyone, it's okay. But where is that when it comes to incest? Okay, so the kid is now consenting age, they're 18 or whatever. You know, you're not hurting your neighbors, so it's okay. Is there something innately wrong with it? Or as long as they're not hurting anyone, it's okay. It fell there, didn't it? Let's talk about today, today is a Father's Day. There are people who had their father died in the past and it grieves them a lot. So are you allowed to post a picture of your father on Facebook and Instagram on how much you love your dad? Or are you not supposed to because it's gonna hurt some people because they lost their dad and it's the most painful day of their life? Let's talk about baby pictures. There are moms who can't have babies anymore or they're just physically unable to have it. If you gave birth and your family is excited about your birth of a kid and you expressing that on Facebook or Instagram might hurt someone unintentionally and they're like, oh, I'm so grieved because I can't have kids. 
are you not supposed to post that anymore? As long as it doesn't hurt anyone, it doesn't work, because you've been hurting people left and right. Is there something that's innately wrong with certain saying whether it hurts people or not? And there are. And in today's age, in today's age, we don't live according to God's law, we live according to whatever our heart says. And what Jeremiah 17 9 says is your heart is deceitful of all things. If you really want something, you're gonna make all the excuse in the world to make it right, to make it sound plausible. I remember reading, uh, reading this um, uh, news article about this lady who was cheating on this on her husband, and you know the husband was super pissed. And the lady's argument was, just because an object entered my body doesn't mean that our marriage should stop. It doesn't mean anything. And I was like, man, where are we going? Like this is crazy. Like the arguments that I hear. And we're really going there more and more. We're becoming lawless people. And this is what Jesus said. This is the sign of the end that people will be lawless. People will be persecuted. There is going to be all the signs that are happening. But what he's saying is this. When you buy into those things, you will fall away. And I'm giving you this cheat sheet so that you may all pass. It's that hard. It's that hard to not love the world and follow what the world says and be faithful to God's word. And my question to you is this, if you don't ever struggle with God's truth in the world, and even as a pastor, I struggle with that, not that I'm trying to like, not that I have a hard time obeying God, but I struggle with how do I love people with God's truth? How do, I, how do I reconcile some of the things that people might find offensive? How do I tell people that God's way is better than what the world says? And there is that big struggle, but at the end of the day, I say God is true, and man is a liar, and I don't trust man, and I trust God, and God is right all the time. And there needs to be a, 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 a resolve in that, and unless you have that resolve, you will be falling away because of these things. Either there is persecution comes and you fall away, you love the world and you fall away, you don't agree with God and you fall away. And there's so many young adults that talk to me and they're like, you know why I don't go to church? It's because there's stands on homosexuality. And you know what I say to them? I see and I know your lifestyle. It's not the homosexuality that you're not going to church, it's because you really love premarital sex. Let's be honest. You love to have sex with your boyfriend and girlfriend, and that's why you don't like going to church, because you get convicted. They make it about everything else, and it's really that, and some of the people that I know. I'm not saying it's generally everyone, but there's some of the people that are like talking to me, and I'm like, no, it's not. Let's be honest. And I love an atheist. There's like this atheist. I really loved him before being so honest. He's like, you know, when I found out that God could be dead, and he grew up Catholic, and then when you went to college, you took philosophy class, and you know, in Nietzsche, there's like, God is dead, you know, like, when did he learn that? You know what he said? I loved it. And you know why he said I loved it? It's like, that means I can have sex as much as I want, I don't want to feel bad about it. That's, like, he was so honest. I'm like, can you guys please be honest like him? Like, I love that. Like, I love some honesty. If you're gonna sin, sin with honesty, you know? Sin with some integrity. I don't know what that means, but you know what I mean? Like, come on. It's okay, I'd rather work with someone who's like honest than a person who's hiding it and making it about everything else. You know, I have a pastor friend, he's like, he knows it's like he, one of his students is like you know like living together with his girlfriend and uh, you know he's in young adult and he's uh, you know he supposedly accepted the Lord but he's like living you know like like that and then but everything about the pastor's sermon bothers him and in my head and you know, like you're too harsh or too this or too that and I'm like in my own life it's really not about his sermon it's really about you. You really don't. You, you, you really don't feel comfortable because you're sinning, and the presence of God is just convicting you all the time. And you think it's everything else, but it's not. It's your sin. <clears throat> and you know, it's just last. My question is this: Do you love God more than the things of the world? If someone was to put a gun over your head, and you know, it's not something you really know until it happens. You know, and says, "Hey, unless you deny Christ, I'll kill you right now." Do you believe that there is afterlife? Do you, do you believe in God that um, this is a, not the end of the story, 80 years in the earth, that this is just a internship for a best job or best life that you're ever gonna have? You know, when it comes to morals, is he right or are you right? Or is God right or is the world right? If you keep on living in a, in a way that your mind does not submit to God's way, this is what Jesus is telling you. You will fall away because your mind your mind does not agree with me. Your mind does not submit to me. I am not the king of your life. One day you will fall away. 
And then this is what he says over and over, those who persevere to the end, those who overcome all these things, will be saved. Those who does not fall away will be saved. Those who remain faithful, faithful will be saved. And Jesus is telling us this is really because it's freaking hard. And it's only going to get harder to believe in Jesus when the end time comes. And Jesus is saying, it's not those you know, Sunday church attenders that's going to be saved. It's like literally those people who are sold out for Jesus, who are going to be like, Jesus is my life. Jesus is my way. And unless you give him everything that you have, you might lose everything that you have. The point of your life is not being free from a master. The point of your life is to find a good master who will give you life that you ever wanted. Where is your heart? Is God the lower of your heart? Do you submit to God and do you say God's ways are higher? Or do you say, I don't know. I think the world might be right. I kind of like the world. I kind of like sinning. I don't like laws that God has put over my life. And when you do, temptation will rise even more. And I think today is a good day for you to repent. And today is a good day for you to say, God, help me be strong in you. Help me to be faithful in you. So let's pray. Come, Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for what you told us. Lord, that you love us so much that you did not leave us as orphan. You've given us the Holy Spirit inside of our hearts and you've given us your word as guidance. And your word is a lamp unto our feet. Father, as temptation arises, as things change and as things come, Father, would you give us faithfulness unto you? As the world says God is wrong, would you give us a mind and a heart that says, God, you are good. Even the whole world might think you're evil. But we know you're good. And we submit to your kingship, we submit to your lordship. Father, would you come and renew our minds. And I just want to encourage you guys, if there is, is a, a part of your heart and your mind that says, Man, I struggle with some of the stuff that Pastor Jay said. If that's in you and that's okay, you know, would you just ask for strength to overcome those things? Say, God, come and give me strength so that I may overcome some of my objections I have towards you, some of my uh, doubts I have towards you. And if it's sinning, uh, you love lawlessness in your heart. You're like, why can't I do whatever I want? Would you just repent and say, God, I, 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 would you forgive me? Cleanse me with your blood. Lord, renew my mind so that I may think your ways are better, your ways are higher. Jesus, humbly spirit. Lord, would you convict our hearts for it is good? Would you help us to go the right way? For your way is life. Lord, help us to give up the things of the world, the things that we hold on to, the idols that we hold on to. Lord, help us to love you as foremost, above all else, that we will love you with our hearts, mind, soul, and strength. Lord, would you also forgive us for our sins of thinking that you're not good sometimes, of thinking that your ways are not the best way for my life, Lord, we repent and help us to cling on to you, the giver of life, the giver of truth, the judge of who is good and evil. We pray in Jesus Christ's name.